Good evening. Dr. Dexter James, CEO of the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Mrs. Pat Hadley, co-chair of the campus 50th anniversary committee. Mrs. Christiane Walcott, head of the FMS um, organizing committee for this 50th um, anniversary lecture series. Um, deputy deans, um, fellow faculty, ladies and gentlemen. Um, welcome to the Henry Fraser Lecture Theater and the Faculty of Medical Sciences. The Faculty of Medical Sciences is, is in the process of putting on a series of lectures to commemorate the 50th anniversary of independence. And this is the third in a series of lectures. We've had a lecture on obesity, one on hypertension, and now one on glaucoma. All topics very relevant um, to healthcare in Barbados. And the faculty has been around since 2008, the full five-year program, but many of you might not realize that we have been training clinical students in the fifth year since 1967 in the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. So we've had a long relationship with the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. Um, and from the late 70s, we were, have been training the last two years of the, of the, of the clinical program. Um, many of our um, lecturers are associate consultants at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital. And lots of the research reported in Barbados has been done by the Faculty of Medical Sciences uh, at the University of the West Indies. Um, including um, studies in the eye. M several landmark studies um, have been based right here in Barbados. Um, and in many other uh, areas, um, chronic diseases, hypertension, um, there, there are lots of studies going on. So you haven't come to hear me tonight. And um, our Featured speaker will be induced no, by no other lesser person than Mr. David Callender. Uh, Mr. David Callender, because he's a surgeon, an ophthalmologist, um, and in the British system, we use the term Mr. Um, and so that's a, a higher honor than just being called doctor. Um, Mr. Callender is a classmate of mine, so I can do an easy calculation. He's been in practice 30 years. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Callender. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Dr. Adams. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Ms. Don Grosvenor to you. Miss, I say, because she's also a surgeon, not Dr. Grosvenor. Don joined our department in mid-2000 after graduating in 2000 from the University of the West Indies. Early in her career in ophthalmology, we recognized that she was quite interested in research and she was actually encouraged to pursue that field. She started ophthalmology with us, spent a few years, then went to the UK where she specialized. Then she came back for a short time. And at that time, we recognized we needed some other expertise in the specialty of glaucoma. All of us treat glaucoma patients. But when it's a difficult case, we have no one to refer to. So Dawn took up the challenge, went back to Morpheus Eye Hospital for training, and she came back. Since then, our, I think our glaucoma patients have benefited tremendously from her expertise. And we now have someone we can call upon for that added intervention. Dawn has a very keen interest in, in, in research that has not stopped. She lectures widely to public groups. She teaches medical students, teaches undergraduates, teaches postgraduates. She just likes to teach, and it was quite fitting that she got the post as a lecturer in ophthalmology at UE. So I think the Department of Ophthalmology, the QEH, and the wider public of Barbados has benefited and will continue to benefit from Dr. Grosvenor's expertise. So without any further ado, I will let her speak to you on glaucoma, the silent thief of sight. Ms. Grosvenor. Thank you, Mr. Callender. Good evening, everyone. Um, protocol is already being established, I'll get right into it. It is my pleasure to address you tonight on my favorite 
speaking topic, glaucoma, you'll see the green ribbon on the screen and you'll realize I am wearing the green ribbon and some of your ushers and some people in the audience perhaps as well. That is because it's glaucoma week. It's World Glaucoma Week where we try to raise awareness of glaucoma. So it's very fitting that this month's campus lecture is on the topic, Glaucoma Silent Thief of Sight. Sometimes talking about glaucoma is a bit like this quote. I don't know if you remember. I mean, it's, we've been inundated with information and media about the American politicians and the elections, and I couldn't resist putting this quote up. A bit of a throwback Thursday moment. Donald Rumsfeld with his known knowns and unknown unknowns and things in between. Talking about glaucoma is a bit like talking about this. There's much that we know, but there's so much more that we don't know. Um, if I attempted to tell you everything that we knew about glaucoma or share as much as we could this evening, it would take us quite a long time. So I hope that by the end of the evening, at least you'll have an understanding of what glaucoma is, why it's important to us in Barbados and the region, and what we can do about it. Now it's not important just because I say it is, because I'm a glaucoma specialist, so obviously it's important to me. It's not important because there are famous people who have glaucoma, Whoopi Goldberg, Andrea Bocelli, and Bono of the band U2. It's important because it's the number one cause of irreversible blindness worldwide and in Barbados. And the good news is that blindness from glaucoma is largely avoidable, but awareness is a really big part of that effort, uh, hence the activities for World Glaucoma Week. But what is glaucoma? Usually I approach this topic from a scientific point of view and give you an official definition, but I thought I'd go back a little bit and do a bit of a historical perspective. Those people who are versed in ancient Greek, it derives from the Greek glaucos, used by Homer to mean a sparkling silver glare, and later denoted colors such as sky blue or green. We think that that comes from the appearance of the eye in acute glaucoma, which is actually the rarest form of glaucoma, and one of the very few times you will get symptoms or signs in glaucoma. Hippocrates, in his writings on aphorisms, mentioned glaucosis, and that's the first time it appeared in medical writings for ophthalmology. In his infirmities of the age it associated, uh, he said that it was associated with dimness of the vision. Fast forward to the 17th century, and we found the first original and clear recognition of the disease in the first book of ophthalmology in English as a disease with a tetrad of four features, eye tension, which is eye pressure, long duration of the disease, the absence of perception of light, which really means blindness, and the presence of a fixed pupil. So even then, we had a good idea of what glaucoma is all about. I haven't skipped the 18th century, but they seem to have forgotten about eye pressure during the 18th century, and in the 19th century, the importance was re-emphasized. In the 20th century, we identified it as a disease of the optic nerve. And now, we are wondering, we're asking the question, is it a disease of the brain? This question arose because of the connections between the eyeball and the brain via the optic nerve. If you look at this picture, uh, you'll see that the optic nerve is this bit. It starts at the back of the eyeball, not the back of the head as many people might think, but the back of the eyeball and runs to join its connections in the middle part of the brain. Scientists recently have discovered that very early in optic nerve damage from glaucoma, the cells of the brain, this area where the, where the nerve connects to the midbrain, those are the ones that show the earliest damage. And it begs the question, is this a disease of the brain, not just of the optic nerve? Um, they, that opens some avenues for investigation because we now wonder, is this related to the neurodegenerative disorders like Alzheimer's and Parkinson's disease? And that might sound a bit scary for glaucoma patients, but on the plus side, on the flip side, it actually opens a lot more avenues for potential therapy, for potential research into therapy, and perhaps for cross uh, communication between the disciplines as more work is done in the field of neurodegenerative disorders. But to go back to Donald Rumsfeld, that is an, a known unknown. We're not sure. What we know for sure is that it is a disease of the optic nerve. There are many different types of glaucoma. What they all have in common is that there's damage to the nerve. You have primary open angle glaucoma, which is the most common one. This is the kind of glaucoma that we see in Barbados most of all. Primary angle closure glaucoma, that's the rare one. More blinding, 
uh, but that's the one that gives you that bluish color of the eye potentially. The secondary glaucomas are a special category where something has happened to the eye before, perhaps an injury, and that has led to glaucoma much later on. And then the childhood glaucomas, extremely rare but incredibly important. We're very privileged in ophthalmology to be dealing with a part of the body in which we can actually see the nerve in real life and see the blood vessels in real life. This is what it looks like when we look into the back of the eye. We've got the retina and this round structure here looks a bit like a donut with a pink on the outside and a space in the middle. That is the optic nerve, the nerve to the eye. And we see the blood vessels running over the nerve. In glaucoma, there is a very characteristic pattern of damage. It is almost as if it was a donut and you started to eat your donut from the middle going out so that that space in the middle gets gradually bigger and bigger as you lose that healthy pink nerve tissue. And this is the result. With the healthy optic nerve, the space is smaller and you've got a lot of pink tissue around. And with glaucoma, you can see that now you've got a giant space and you really have to search hard to find any residual pink tissue. That is the damage in glaucoma. The unfortunate thing is that this damage is irreversible. However, we can stabilize it and save people's vision. That damage is important because this is what it does to the vision. It starts to damage the peripheral vision, and you see in, this is a traffic scene as if you were looking through the windscreen of a car, and as the glaucoma damage develops, we start to lose areas in the periphery. Now this is a mock-up presentation. Glaucoma patients don't actually see black spots in their vision because the, the brain tricks you and tries to fill that in. But essentially, it emphasizes the fact that it is the central vision that is left last of all. And you can see here in this traffic scene, initially you can see pedestrians crossing the road, you can see cars on either side. And then as the damage closes in, you start to lose the, the car. And then finally you lose the pedestrians. So having glaucoma has real implications for driving if people have damage that gets to this stage. The damage is very subtle. Uh, as this video shows, you almost couldn't see where that damage began, and this takes many, many years to, pr to progress to this level. If it's happening in only one eye, the other eye kind of picks up the slack and covers it up. So often patients don't know they have a problem until very late in the disease. This is why it's called the silent thief of sight, or the sneak thief of sight, because it creeps up on us from the peripheral vision that we don't use so regularly. So the official definition is that it's a group of diseases, we say that now because we know there are different types, in which there's characteristic progressive damage to the optic nerve. We saw that characteristic damage with the enlargement of the central area, resulting in damage to the visual field. But what about the eye pressure? Because when we talk about glaucoma, or perhaps when you hear people talking about glaucoma, we're always going on about the eye pressure. So why is the eye pressure not in the definition? Well, the eye pressure is vitally important because we think that it is the pressure inside the eye that damages the nerve. However, there's a variant of glaucoma in which the eye pressure is normal, but the nerve damage still occurs. So the pressure was removed from the definition. That type of glaucoma is called normal tension glaucoma. And in those cases, we think that the nerve is particularly susceptible for some other reason. So damage still happens even at a lower pressure, even at a normal pressure. So now that we understand what it is, uh, we can think about what causes glaucoma. Now we understand it's important. The idea should be that we figure out the cause, we go back and stop it at the root. Not so easy, because no one knows for sure. There are many theories about glaucoma causation, why it starts, how it progresses, what actually initiates the damage. And in medicine, we know that as long as there are many theories for anything, that usually means we don't really know what's going on. And that's true about glaucoma, and, and you can see why, because the optic nerve is a very complex thing. This is a pictorial representation of the nerve cells that go to form the optic nerve. This row here, the big pink ones, these are the retinal ganglion cells, and they come together at the optic nerve when they leave the back of the eye. It's almost like a ponytail for the ladies who might appreciate that where you've got all these cells running around the surface on the inside of the eye, and then they all come together at the back and go out in the optic nerve. Is it mechanical? Perhaps it's the effect of the raised eye pressure. That's what we think. That's a core part of the theory. But it could also be vascular. Uh, we can see that these are the nerve, nerve, bi 
nerve bundles within the optic nerve, and you can see how intertwined the small blood vessels are, how significantly close they are. If, if, the, if the blood vessel supply is not good, then you will have nerve damage as well. This is what we think happens in those patients who have normal tension glaucoma, where the nerve is compromised at a normal blood eye pressure. Is it by a chemical? Just like us, nerve cells get stressed, they're working hard, they're working constantly, they die, then dying nerve cells release glutamate, which potentiates the effect. That tells other nerve cells around, this is not a good environment, and they start to die. It's a vicious chain reaction. Or is it immunological? There are autoantibodies which have been recognized to retinal and optic nerve antigens, and they activate the glial cells and the complement pathway, and they also cause cell death. This is what a retinal ganglion cell looks like, and you can see the number of communications that it has. This is the one long fiber that will go towards the optic nerve. So it's a very complex picture. It's not just one cell alone. It's the inter interplay between many cells and many mechanisms. We actually think that all of these mechanisms have a role to play. Well, if we don't know what the cause is, then perhaps we can figure out what the risk factors are and avoid them or eliminate them. And that brings us to the Barbados Eye Studies. Well, it's very fitting that this is one of the independence lectures because the Barbados Eye Studies typify the spirit of these Errol Barrow's words. We will be friends of all and satellites of none. Uh, we enlisted the help of, and I say we, but these studies predate me back in the 1980s. Uh, Barbados enlisted the help of its friends up north at the State University of New York, Stony Brook, and Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, and these studies were funded by the National Eye Institute. They were born out of a desire to address the need for good epidemiological data on glaucoma, cataract, age-related macular degeneration and diabetic retinopathy in a predominantly black population. And having done them now, we have a plethora of data about glaucoma and other eye diseases, which allows us to be truly independent of the international um, environment. Even in the hallowed halls at Moorfields, I mean, there, there are many pieces of data that came out of the Barbados Eye Studies, but the glaucoma data is the one that has traveled far and wide. Um, even in the hallowed halls at Moorfields Eye Hospital, when people heard that I was from Barbados, uh, they didn't say, oh, like Rihanna, which is what you get so often. They said, oh, like the Barbados Eye Studies. So it just shows you how far that data has traveled. It also could mean that we were very nerdy at Moorfields, but I think they would accept that. So the Barbados Eye Studies are the largest epidemiological study on a population of predominantly West African descent. They examined Barbadian-born citizens aged 40 to 84 uh, via a random sample of national ID numbers from the St Statistical Services Department. These patients were examined at Vincent Scott Polyclinic. So if you have patients now, and I still have some patients now who were in the Barbados Eye Studies who remember going to the polyclinic and having all these tests done, uh, what they're saying is legitimate. A lot of eye work came out of the Winston Scott Polyclinic at that time, 1988 and onwards. <coughs> the data was, the study was coordinated out of Stony Brook in New York, and Johns Hopkins acted as a reading center for a lot of the optic nerve photographs that were taken. The university obviously had a critical role to play. Uh, via the Chronic Disease Research Center, which is the Faculty of Medical Sciences research arm, uh, and through the work of Professor Hennis, who was a former director of the CDRC. He was actually the project manager for the study and came on after the start. So the university has always been closely linked with glaucoma and this research into glaucoma. So what did, what did we find out from the studies? Well, they tested over 4,000 persons, data collection beginning in 1988, and they reported data after four years and then nine years of study, so it was a pretty long study. The study identified more persons with glaucoma than any previous population study, and we really have to put that in perspective. A small island like Barbados, 166 square miles, uh, at that time, certainly not as many as 280,000 people now. And we still found more persons with glaucoma than any previous population study done in Europe, in North America. They found that 7% of the population over 40 had glaucoma. 
They also found that an additional 3% have early signs that probably will be confirmed as glaucoma. We call those people glaucoma suspects. And we have to include them in the glaucoma care package because we treat them in the same way. So you can really say that the burden of glaucoma that was discovered was 10% of our population, over 40. We, if we look at the last census data, we've got over 280,000 people. The over 40 age group is about 112,000. So that gives us a significant thousands of people in Barbados with glaucoma. And only one glaucoma specialist so far. What are the risk factors? Well, similar to many of the other studies that went before, increasing age. But in Barbados, it was uh, a much greater proportion of persons as they got older. One in 11 persons over the age of 50. I'm not going to ask anybody to tell their age, but I'm sure there are 11 persons in here who are over the age of 50. So we have to think. One in 11 persons over the age of 50 will have glaucoma. One in six persons over the age of 70. We know we're a very long living population, so we're that, that prevalence will increase more and more with age. Race, populations of African descent are more at risk for glaucoma, and that was borne out in the Barbados Eye Studies. Gender, I'm sorry men, but males were found to have a higher risk of glaucoma in the Barbados Eye Studies. Family history is very important. If you have a first degree relative with glaucoma, that is a child, a brother, a sister, a parent with glaucoma, your risk certainly is higher. The, we have a very small population, so it's quite easy to capture that data. And the Barbados Eye Studies Group was actually able to do a spin-off study to examine those families that had a very high level of glaucoma, or we would say glaucoma running right through the family. And when they examined them, they found, they also did genetic studies, incidentally, and they actually found a unique area in, in those families' DNA that was specific just to Barbados. That was the first time that that was discovered. 40% of those families had an area on chromosome 2 that, was, that increased their risk of glaucoma. Lean body mass. It's not often that being thin is a bad thing, but apparently, in Barbados Eye Studies, that increased your risk for glaucoma and low blood pressure. Now, in a country like ours, where hypertension and diabetes are twin evils in the non-communicable disease arena, you can't look at any other chronic disease without perhaps suggesting a link to one or the other. 40% of persons in the Barbados Eye Studies were hypertensive, 18% had diabetes. So they looked very carefully to see if there was a link between this high rate of glaucoma that we had and this high rate of hypertension or diabetes. And they found conclusively that there was no link. So we can't blame our glaucoma risk on the hypertension or the diabetes. Certainly in the Barbados Eye Studies, we know that hypertension and diabetes are not independent risk factors for glaucoma. Low blood pressure, however, is one, and that is because of the, the compromise to the, the optic nerve blood flow that we previous, previously mentioned. We showed those small blood vessels intertwined around the optic nerve. So if your blood pressure is abnormally low, then your nerve will not get enough blood supply, and that could cause damage similar to glaucoma. We're not sure how significant these last two things are, lean body mass and low blood pressure, but perhaps if you are a male of African descent, you're over 50, you're thin, and you have an abnormally low blood pressure, that is not a good combination. I've left this one for last, the raised eye pressure, because this is actually the number one risk factor for glaucoma, and that was confirmed in the Barbados Eye Studies. Incidentally, persons of African descent, and often we find in the Caribbean, that we have very high eye pressure levels. Normal eye pressure, in case anybody wants to know, is between 10 and 21 millimeters of mercury. Some places you'll hear between 11 and 21, um, but we certainly all agree that 21 is the upper limit of normal. If you have a pressure above 21, then that's considered high. We in the clinic often see patients with pressures in their 30s, their 40s, and their 50s. So raised eye pressure is a critical risk factor. What are we going to do about it? We know now that we have these risk factors. We know that the, we can't do much about the other things. We can't change our age, our, ra our race. We can't change the genetics of our gender. We can choose our friends, but we can't choose our family. I don't think we're going to try to get fat or raise our blood pressure just to try to avoid the risk of glaucoma, because we will then run into other problems. So all we can do is try to deal with this raised eye pressure and lower it. 
And the aim of glaucoma pressure, glaucoma treatment, is to lower the eye pressure to a level so that the nerve damage stops, so that that damage to the vision stops. We can't reverse it, but we can stabilize it. Now, if only this was the way that we lowered eye pressure, spa treatment, some tea bags or something on the eye, this might lower your blood pressure, but this is not going to lower your eye pressure. This is what we have to do. Treatment for glaucoma, the mainstay of treatment is eye drops. We're privileged in Barbados, again, um, to have so many eye drops freely available in the drug formulary. The vast majority of eye drops that are available, uh, that are used for glaucoma, and I mean around the world, the vast majority of those categories can be found in the Barbados drug formulary. So that, is, that makes my life a lot easier. Um, in fact, in 2013, I think it was, the, the majority of glaucoma drops went on to the formulary of special benefit drugs, so they're really free at the point of delivery. We've got tablets, uh, which may be used in some circumstances, and then laser treatment. Everyone likes to hear about high-tech things. Laser treatment can be used in angle closure glaucoma, even in open angle glaucoma, but only for specific persons. And this is a picture of a laser iridotomy, what it looks like after treatment. Treatment for glaucoma really has to be individualized. We see that we've got a wide array of drops here. This is a drop in the bucket, really. We have five different categories of glaucoma drops and several different options in each category. So the combinations are many. Um, but we can't put people through a com random numbers of combinations over time, so we really have to individualize the treatment for glaucoma. And then even, even if you could have five eye drops, I'm sure nobody wants to spend all day putting in five different eye drops, because each one works in a different way, and together they potentiate each other. But we know that in order to improve a person's adherence to therapy, we really have a limit to how much medication we can put on the individual patient. If you get to the point where you're taking two bottles of drops, and two bottles might have in four, drop, four different medications or three, because a lot of them come in combination now. If you get to the point where you need more than two bottles of eye drops to control your glaucoma, then we have to think of doing something else. Because once we start to add more and more treatment beyond that, compliance decreases. So what will we do? Surgery is an option that I often have to come to in Barbados. And um, certainly in populations of African descent, sur surgery and good glaucoma surgery is a key part of the glaucoma paradigm of treatment. For some reason, our, our pressures are higher, our glaucoma can be more difficult to control, and we can cycle through these other options very quickly and end up requiring surgery. Um, this is an important point because a lot of people, when I start to discuss surgery, I have the conversation where the pressure is very high, you're on many drops, perhaps tablets as well, perhaps you've already had laser treatment. Once we've exhausted those avenues, we then have to talk, start talking about surgery. And the usual response I get is, surgery for glaucoma? Didn't know that that was possible. But it is possible and we do a lot of it. The fundamental problem in glaucoma is that the circulation of fluid in the eye doesn't work as it should. So we've all got a fluid inside the eye that fills the eye, bathes the tissues inside the eye, and gives the eye its nice round shape. As fast as that fluid is produced, it needs to be drained away down the natural drainage pathway in the eye. But in glaucoma, that drainage system doesn't work very well. So that fluid backs up, we get the high eye pressure and the damage to the nerve. In glaucoma surgery, we create a new drainage pathway to bypass the patient's pathway that isn't working so well. And the two main ways that we do that are by trabeculectomy, where we use the patient's own tissues to fashion a new drainage system, or with a glaucoma implant, where we bypass the drainage system altogether with an artificial implant. Again, just like the other forms of treatment, that has to be individualized to the individual person and to the individual eye. But no discussion on glaucoma is complete without talking about herbal remedies. We all. We all have patients, or we all are patients, who would like to have a natural way of doing things, perhaps a, an alternative to all these medications and these tablets. So, and now we know that treatment with this particular herb, cannabis, with marijuana, is very topical because of the legalizations that are happening in various parts of the world. Um, many people are convinced that cannabis is a treatment for glaucoma. But there's a lot of um, information on both sides of the coins, and we have to be very clear and very careful on what it, 
what it can do and what it cannot do. We know that cannabis, sativa, uh, consists of many chemicals. Uh, there are many chemicals within the plant, almost 500 of them, and we know that two of them, the cannabinoids, do lower the eye pressure. I don't think there's any doubt about that. However, we know that glaucoma is more than just about the eye pressure. The cannabinoids that lower the eye pressure do so for only a short period of time, two hours, three hours, four hours at the maximum. So if you really wanted to use cannabis for glaucoma or cannabis to lower your eye pressure over a 24-hour period, which is what is required to save your vision, you would have to somehow be utilizing this particular herb over a 24-hour period. And if you did that, you would then run into other problems with the deleterious effects of the other compounds. Um, on, the, on the other side, it also lowers the blood pressure somewhat. And with the optic nerve, there is a delicate balance between the blood pressure and the eye pressure. Um, we want the eye pressure to be low, but we don't want the blood pressure to be low. So if you have a medication which lowers your eye pressure, but it also lowers your blood pressure significantly, that's going to be a problem because that's not going to help us. And it is for that reason that um, various medical associations, I'm not sure how this projects, but the American Academy of Ophthalmology, the Canadian Ophthalmological Society, the European Glaucoma Society uh, have said that their official position is that there's no scientific evidence for the use of marijuana or related compounds to treat glaucoma at the moment. I'm sure the debate will continue. So we know all of this about glaucoma. We know the risk factors in our population. We know how to lower the eye pressure. We're doing glaucoma surgery for those patients for whom eye drops and the usual medications aren't working. So why are people still going blind? What are we missing? Well, one thing is late detection. And we can't get away from that. Certainly by the time people, by the time I see people often, um, they have so much nerve damage that there's so little left to save. It takes a long time for nerve damage to accumulate, but once it is there, it's not reversible. We can only work with what is there with what is left. So if 90% of your nerve is gone by the time we realize that you have glaucoma, or by the time we realize that you need surgery, we've only got 10% to work with. If you are age 40 at that point in time, we're trying to get 10% of a nerve to last a, a lifetime, 60 more years. And that is a very difficult prospect. That is one of the key reasons that people are still going blind, this late detection. The only way to get around that is to detect the glaucoma early. It is a silent disease. There are no symptoms until very, very late in the in the course. It is painless generally. Your eyes look perfectly normal. People who have glaucoma may still see perfect 2020 long distance vision, don't wear reading glasses, never had an eye check at all. And you could have 90% of your nerve gone in that scenario. Really, the only way to know that you have glaucoma is to get checked for it. And that is the key message that we try to push in World Glaucoma Week. And the whole eye care community comes together um, to do several free tests. We've been doing that all week and we will finish at the QEH with a large testing period on Saturday all day. But early detection really is the key. Then we have challenges in treatment, availability and access. We have less so than perhaps our Eastern Caribbean neighbors. Um, adherence, because at the end of the day, we as physicians can only prescribe treatment, we can only advise. At the end of the day, it's the individual person who has to make that commitment, has to remember every day to take their medication. And then timely escalation of treatment. It's important, we have a responsibility as physicians as well, because it is a team effort. If the patient is doing their part and coming to their appointments and taking their drops, we have to make sure that we do our part and pick up when the treatment isn't working and it needs to be stepped up or when they need glaucoma surgery. But there's a lot happening in glaucoma. There's a lot of hope for the future and there are a lot of technological advances and research advances that are, that are in the mix on all sides. And here we have a picture of the OCT scan on the diagnostic side. We now can scan the eye qu quickly and easily and actually see even greater detail in the optic nerve. We can see the damage not just in that donut pattern but almost in 3D. You can see that huge cut in the nerve uh, and that allows us to pick up damage a lot earlier. 
Now we have new OCT machines and new machines that can pick up the damage even before we do in the, with the naked eye, even before the computerized visual field testing picks up a change. And we're now using these instruments together with the traditional instruments to give us a much better idea of person's glaucoma progression. So that when my patients ask me, well, how long will my vision last? How, am I going blind? How fast is my vision deteriorating? We can, we can actually calculate that, or the computers will calculate it for us now. New treatments. We've talked about eye drops have been the mainstay of treatment for many, many years, and now we're in the biotechnology era. So there's a lot of investigation into nanotechnology. Uh, I was at a seminar about a year and a half ago, the American Glaucoma Society meeting, and a paper from Singapore was presented where they have created um, a nanosome. So basically a very tiny molecule which contains glaucoma medication, which can now be injected under the conjunctive of the eye very easily and lasts for three months at a time. No more drops every day, no more five, hours, five bottles of drops, just a little injection which is completely painless because we can numb the eye very easily just with eye drops every three months. That was successful in animal trials and they had done six human patients in whom it was well tolerated and then they were stepping that up into um, human trials. So those are the sort of things that are happening in terms of glaucoma treatment. And of course, there'll be many more things that we won't hear about until they break on the scene. But what we really want for those people who have lost vision or who are losing vision is to, to be able to regenerate the nerve, to be able to take that bitten out donut back to the way it was before. We see how complex the nerve cells are. We see that they don't work in isolation. There are many different connections between the nerve cells. And it's been very hard to grow optic, to grow optic nerve cells in the lab. But it has been done in Europe and in North America and different uh, research labs. The problem is getting all these nerve cells to work together the way they normally would in the normal human eye. And then we saw that long stretch of nerve from the eyeball to the middle of the brain. Even if we got the nerves to grow together and we got them to work well together to then persuade them to continue on that path and regenerate towards the brain or the other direction. That has proven to be extremely difficult, but there is also a lot of research progressing in that area. And again, nanotechnology is being used to bridge those gaps where bits of the nerves are missing to sort of guide them along the way. So we never know. Perhaps one day we will have a cure for glaucoma, but that is what will be required. Regeneration, a newer protection of the nerve. But this is all very highfalutin and high-flying. Realistically, what can we do if we have glaucoma? Well, healthy lifestyle choices, of course. The eyes are, after all, part of the body. And if you have an unhealthy body, then you're likely to have unhealthy eyes. We saw those tiny blood vessels in the eye they have to be protected, so healthy lifestyle choices. A low salt diet, Dr. Connell will be happy to hear me say that. Controlling your blood pressure. Um, lots of antioxidants, particularly now that we know that, that, or we suspect that this could be a disease of the brain and similar to other neurodegenerative diseases. Oxidative stress on the nerve cells is very important and we can avoid that by using um, fruits and vegetables rich in antioxidants. The green leafy vegetables are very good for the eyes. I know traditionally we hear carrots, but the green leafy vegetables are very good. If you're a glaucoma pa patient, take your medication every day and use whatever technology, whatever support you have to do to help to remind you to do that. Work in partnership with your eye care professional. And it's a partnership. It's not the eye doctor saying what you have to do and you just doing that blindly. Ask questions get the information that you need to take care of yourself and your family. If you're going to have an eye test just for glasses, ask your optometrist if they've checked for glaucoma. Oftentimes they have, they haven't seen any sign of it, so they haven't mentioned it, but you don't know it's been done, so ask. So that if they haven't done it, then you can get that test done. So what are the take home messages about this sneak thief of sight? It's silent, remember, it's blinding, but early detection can change all that. Testing is quick and painless, and anyone who's gone through it this week with us will know. Uh, and I encourage you to get tested and encourage others around you to get tested as well. Um, to the eye professionals, remember to do a thorough check for glaucoma. 
Even if someone comes in with a bloodshot eye, we still have to do a full eye check. To the family physicians, the GPs, other medical practitioners, the medical students, when you're taking your histories, ask your patients about glaucoma. Um, we always make sure people have had their blood pressure check and their diabetes check, but we have to add a glaucoma check to that. This is the number one cause of irreversible blindness in Barbados. And for want of one question, uh, somebody could go blind. I, in fact, one of the patients that really inspired me to do glaucoma, to go into this field, is a gentleman who I met in that interval that Mr. Cal Calendar talked about when I came back to Barbados after doing my basic training. And he came into the room with a diagnosis of suspected glaucoma referred from his optometrist to whom he had gone because he suddenly realized he wasn't seeing as he should. And when I examined his eyes, his pressures were 50 in both eyes. Um, his nerves were damaged 180%, 190%. And he was already having difficulty driving, difficulty doing his job. And he burst into tears in the examination room. Big hardback man. Um, well-educated, so it's not an education deficit. And he said, you know, I get my blood pressure checks, I get my diabetes checks, I get my prostate checks, and if I had known that I should have had my eyes checked, if I had known that I should have had a glaucoma check, I would have got it done, right? And I thought that that should never happen. To the policy makers, um, we have excellent support from the Ministry of Health, and from the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, and I really want to encourage them to continue to support our efforts to uh, provide patients with the care that they need. So the researchers, this is a field ripe with opportunities. We heard about the work that came out of the CDRC starting back in the 1980s and extending uh, right through to the 90s. The Barbados Eye Studies were still, group were still producing papers even in the early 2000s. But now that we have all of this information about glaucoma in Barbados, we should really take a next step. What is the best way to treat glaucoma? Um, how are our surgeries working? Uh, we, we need to go a step further. What are, what are the genet genetic markers that we should be looking for in glaucoma? The biomarkers, the immunological markers. There is a lot of opportunity within this field and we have a captive population in Barbados. Uh, we have the history of the Barbados Eye Studies behind us so we know that we can handle a big study. Um, so this is really a field to be looked for to the future. So the glaucoma patients don't lose hope because a lot is happening, things are changing all the time. But while you're hoping and praying, take the medication every day. Get support from your relatives and friends and work in partnership with your ophthalmologist. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Grovner. Um, that's a very um, enlightening lecture. Um, it's now question time, and I'll take the opportunity to ask the first question. Um, you've listed all the treatments available and all the eye drops available in Barbados, and you've urged everyone to have their eyes checked. But in the public health care system of Barbados, um, how would one get your eyes checked? How, you know, we, we, we do check for hypertension because we have persons like Dr. Connell here who pushes it. We, everybody has blood pressure cuffs, and we can check it at every clinic. We check for diabetes because we can easily check for that in a, in a primary care clinic. But how will we check for glaucoma without maybe accessing a, a one-off free testing or paying for it? That's an excellent question. What we really need is to integrate eye care and eye testing into the primary health care system. Um, the Ministry of Health, I think, has taken steps in that direction already because we now have a national eye care committee and a national eye care plan, which is part of the primary health care plan to examine the problems and find solutions. At the moment, you don't have eye testing facilities within the polyclinics or within the primary health care system. If someone wanted a free eye test outside of glaucoma week, they would have to get a referral letter from the doctor and have it done at the hospital. That is not ideal because we are so stretched and so heavily burdened at the hospital. Um, just this week, because of the activity and all of the attention we're getting out of glaucoma week, 
one of our donors has um, approached me with a plan to provide us perhaps with some equipment potentially that we could use to extend eye care testing outside of the week and into the primary health care system. At the moment, it is aspirational, it is a plan, but I think that is what we have to do. One week of testing is not enough. We really need to integrate the eye care testing into the primary health program. Yes, um, I think we do, and it's been years since we have all these studies. You said one in 10 persons over 40, well, seven and 3%. Um, Dr. George? Okay, thanks, Don. I have two questions. Sorry, Dr. Grovner. Ms. Grovner, sorry. I have two questions. Don is fine. Uh, question number one. Uh, for things like diabetes, hypertension, we usually have guidelines where we tell patients you start checking at X age or if you have a family history, you start testing at Y age. Mm -hmm. what is the, are there any recommendations for glaucoma as to what age should we start testing? That's question number one. And question number two is that you, you said that glaucoma is not about elevated eye pressure, you can have a normal pressure and have glaucoma, but yet most of these treatments seem to be geared towards reducing eye pressure. So then how do you treat glaucoma when the eye pressure is normal? So to the first question, um, which was, remind me, age for testing. Internationally, the guidelines are as people get older. So either from age 40 and up, because you'll see the eye studies examine people from age 40 and up because that is the age at which you start to see the, the incidence and prevalence of glaucoma increasing. In other populations in the developed world, where their prevalence is only 1% or 2% compared to our 7%, they might test at age 60 or 65 and up. In Barbados, because of our very high prevalence and because of this high, uh, this family history link, I suggest that people get, start getting tested from the time they're an adult, from 21. It doesn't mean that you have to have an eye test every year from 21 and up, but you should get one eye test at 21. If you're fine, then you might not need your eyes tested again for five years and then five years after that. And then when you get to 40 or 50, you can then do it annually. I say that because the youngest person that I have certified as blind from glaucoma was 27. So, you know, early testing from 21 is what we need to do in our population because we don't know who is the person that's gonna get glaucoma in their 20s or in their 30s. I do have patients in their 30s with really advanced glaucoma already. Uh, uh, Dawn, oh sorry. <coughs> Dawn, excellent lecture. Uh, I, I couldn't help um, while the lecture was taking place to uh, make note of some very salient points that you'd have mentioned um, regarding glaucoma in terms of its uh, uh, pathophysiology and some of these things I would have mentioned to some of the students while I would have teach pharmacology, looking at some of those pharmacotherapeutic agents. Uh, but I don't want to speak about the conventional pharmacotherapeutic agents. Um, you showed a very interesting slide there that caught my attention. And at one point I felt like all hope was lost for cannabis sativa as an option for the treatment of marijuana until on one of your last slides, you mentioned that person should really consider taking green vegetable matter. And I was saying, <laughs> well, you know, I thought a couple of slides ahead, you said, you know, cannabis sativa, the evidence is there is weak. Um, but for the purpose of the audience here, um, who may have heard about medical marijuana use for glaucoma, I would just like to start off by telling a small story for about 30 seconds. Uh, it was developed in Jamaica by Professor Man Lewis and Dr. Lockhart, uh, who developed canosol from the cannabis sativa, yes? Uh, but the actual development started because Professor Man Lewis, who was a pharmacologist at the University of West Indies, Mona, he was also a fisherman. And he would go out in rural Jamaica uh, to fish with other fishermen in the dark, in the night, at midnight. And the men would smoke marijuana before they go fishing. And when Manley asked the guys, why is it that you smoke marijuana every night before they go fishing? They said, you know, it allows us to see better at night. And it was from there he led his scientific research and study into this plant for glaucoma, and they actually developed canosol. Now, you pointed out that canosol only reduced the uh, intracocal pressure for a couple hours, and you would essentially will have to be on marijuana for at least the whole day, and more than likely will have the adverse effects associated with marijuana, possibly psychosis, etc. that we know of. But is there any hope 
in further exploration of marijuana in, in terms of trying to identify the actual phytochemical constituents uh, to see essentially how they how do they go about reducing that pressure and uh, ameliorating some of the symptoms associated with glaucoma? And not only trying to reduce the pressure by reducing the uh, aqueous humor in the eye, but what if these compounds were somehow interacting at the level of the nerve? Seeing that you pointed out that it's still somewhat of an unknown if it's really the damaged nerve which is driving the, intra the increase in the intracoral pressure or if it's the eye intraocular pressure, which is essentially damaging the nerve. Um, we've heard about, I was hearing about Canisol from medical student days, and uh, now I actually have a patient who's on Canisol, not prescribed by, by yours truly, but who intermittently gets some Canisol. Part of the challenge with eye drops is that the eye requires that drops have dual properties. They have to be fat soluble and they have to be water soluble in order to get into, inside the eye, into the aqueous humor to be active. Um, a lot of plant derived compounds don't have those dual properties. They're usually fat soluble and that makes it much more challenging. Even though you may have extracted just that active component that you need into a drop, getting it inside the eye is the challenge. Then of course with a lot of um, herbal medications, because they haven't been studied as much as the traditional pharmaceutical medications, because it takes a lot of money to study a new drug and to produce a new drug, we don't know a lot of these specifics, and we had this discussion, the specifics of the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of it. If marijuana um, was a neuroprotective or a neuroregenerative agent, that would explode on all the world's media. That would be a huge revelation. Um, because we know that it's been looked at for many other diseases, spinal cord injuries, chronic pain, things that affect the spinal cord as well. Nerve tissue that is similar to brain tissue, chronic seizures. Um, but so far we haven't found that it is helpful to the optic nerve specifically. But as we know, we hear constantly about medical marijuana and its use, so we know that there is, if there is one herb which is being studied, it is marijuana. And if there is going to be a breakthrough for glaucoma or a breakthrough for the optic nerve, then I'm sure that that is going to be one of the early things to be, to be discovered. But so far, we, we have not found that to be the case. And I just want to add, Dr. Kohol is from Jamaica. <laughs> and they are growing legal marijuana plants on campus in Jamaica now. Somebody made a mistake last time I was in Jamaica and said it's the first ever marijuana plant grown in, in Jamaica and somebody had to correct, everybody laughed and they said the first, and corrected, the first legal plant was grown. <laughs> legal plants. Um, the lady over there in... Hi. Hi. Sorry. Um, good night. Colette, uh, Colette's question. With, uh, low but still oh yes, of course. Sorry about that, Colette. Before I go, go on there, I'll, I'll just dip back to the marijuana question. Part of the reason I'm so cautious about marijuana is that I, anecdotally in my practice, I haven't seen um, it working in a positive way. We have, and we have to remember that glaucoma in our population is very different and it's a very individual thing. So what uh, there may be some stories, like I have a patient whose father used to crush uh, the marijuana leaves and make a paste of it and put it in his eye and he never went blind. But his son, who is a, is a prolific marijuana smoker, is very much almost blind. Um, the young person who I certified as blind, a heavy marijuana user. And a third one of my young patients who has lost vision at a very early age is also a heavy marijuana user. So this is my reason for caution because you know there may be positive benefits and maybe it worked for one generation, but when glaucoma affects the younger generation, it can do so more aggressively and it can usually happen 10 years earlier. So we have to be a little more cautious because we have to keep that vision going for a much longer time and those are not people to experiment with. To Colette's question about the low, the normal pressure patients, even though their pressure is normal, which means it's, 20, it's, un, it's 21 and under, we still lower the eye pressure more because we find that even though their pressure is statistically not high, it is too high for that nerve. So we lower those pressures to 10, to 11, as close to 10 as we can get them, and that can stabilize 
uh, that can stabilize their, their glaucoma as well. Those patients are, are some of the most difficult to treat because how low can you go with your eye pressure? You still need to have some level of pressure in the eye. And when we start to get down to single digits like nine or eight, we're starting to get a little too close to, to pressure being too low. We often have to explore other factors. Um, obstructive sleep apnea is something that can happen um, to persons at night and they not know. And often these normal pressure patients are having other insults to the nerve, like obstructive sleep apnea, where they might be having uh, interruptions of their oxygen flow at night, and that might be damaging the nerve independently. They might have these low blood pressure dips at night, so sometimes I send them to Dr. Connell to have a 24-hour blood pressure check. So we try to explore all the other avenues and fix what we can. But again, usually it comes back to still treating the eye pressure. Because if their pressure is 18, that is statistically normal, but that can be lowered to 10. Yes, there is a obstructive sleep apnea has been recognized now as a risk factor for glaucoma. It's not one of the things that they explored in the Barbados Eye Studies, but that's something that we found subsequently. And not just with any kind of glaucoma, but in glaucoma in those patients with a normal pressure, normal tension glaucoma. So obstructive sleep apnea is not to be taken lightly. I think it's now a risk factor for hypertension as well. So not to be taken lightly at all. Hi, good night. Um, my question is regards to regenerating the nerves, about them growing together and functioning together. Um, I know with patients that are on life support, we always consider organ donation and stuff like that. Um, have we considered nerve donation from one patient to another where those nerves are already working together and so it would be a lot easier placing them in another patient? If only that were true, it would make life a lot uh, easier in the glaucoma world. Uh, we don't have an or organ donor program here, but overseas you can imagine that people do donate their eyes to science, to medical science. The problem with the optic nerve is once it is cut, it won't work again. So once it is removed from one person, that's it. It's not going to work in another person. However, stem cells uh, are an area of burgeoning attention as well, and there is attention through the Glaucoma Research Foundation in North America at stem cell therapy to regrow nerve cells, to encourage new growth in nerve cells and to be involved in neuroprotection as well. Thank you, Don, and congrats on a great lecture. So low blood pressure is bad for you. And uh, if you have glaucoma. And I just wondered, and maybe you touched on it just now, whether these patients who have hypertension and glaucoma that are quite rigidly and tightly controlled, whether they should go on to have a 24-hour ABPM done for those nocturnal dips at night. If we think the glaucoma is progressing, then it might be worth doing that. Uh, because when we see that patients' blood eye pressure is normal, but their glaucoma is still progressing, then we know something else is at play. There's another factor, and that's when we start to ask those questions. That's when we start to refer people on for those 24-hour uh, blood pressure checks. Um, for patients with glaucoma, it's probably not a good idea for them to take their blood pressure medication at night. I think most blood pressure medication now is dosed in the morning, but if we see that a patient is progressing and they take their medication at night, then we might suggest we'll take that in the morning instead so you don't lower your blood pressure at night any lower than it should be. Three short questions. Is prolonged exposure to a computer screen a risk factor for glaucoma? And could you link that? I, I'm not sure what macular degeneration is. They talk a lot about glare and all of that. Mm. Is that linked to glaucoma? That's the first one. Is there any research done on races other than African races, for example, Chinese. Mm -hmm. My mother is quarter Chinese and mm -hmm. glaucoma. Okay. And, um, oh, what was oh dear, you're going to okay, challenge me to two. remember these three questions. Okay, two. Yeah, and oh yes, how do you prepare somebody for being blind? What mm -hmm. are the supports in the society for persons who, are, who know they're going to be blind? All right, I'll start with the first one, which was about the computer screen. Glare from the computer screen, not a risk factor for glaucoma. It doesn't make your glaucoma any worse. Um, macular degeneration is a problem where the most sensitive part of the retina, the back of the eye, the part of the retina that, that's responsible for your best vision, your precise vision, your central vision, the reading vision, the vision we're using right now to look at each other, that can be damaged with increasing age. Uh, in an entity called age-related macular degeneration. 
that is actually the number one cause of blindness in over 65 group in the developed world. We don't see it very much in pigmented races, so we don't have a lot of it here in Barbados, but up north that is the number one cause of blindness. Um, there is a theory that the blue light from all of our screens, computer, phone, etc., that that can penetrate the eye and affect the macular macula a little more than other forms of light. So now new types of lenses like blue tech lenses with special filters to filter out that, um, to filter out that blue light are being created. The intraocular lenses that we use now are blue light filtered as well to try to combat that. Um, we all are constantly looking at screens almost all day long. So if it was just the blue light alone, then we would all be in trouble. But there's much more at play with macular degeneration. But if you have an opportunity to get lenses and blue tech lenses, why not? The final question, how do you prepare a patient for blindness? Um, this is one of the most challenging things that I have to deal with because obviously um, I'm dealing with saving vision, but there's some people who are just too far gone. Um, and sometimes even too far gone for surgery, which is the most disappointing thing. When you know that if you had caught this person five years ago, we could have made a world of difference. Support systems are very important. Um, what we need really is an adjustment to blindness team. And uh, because this is not work that a physician can do alone. It takes a lot of counseling, a lot of support work, a lot of peer group work, a lot of family support, social support to talk about um, transitioning into blindness. I have patients who don't want to have surgery or who have refused surgery and who have said, I prefer to hang on to my vision as long as possible, accepting that at some point it will go, rather than uh, have surgery at an advanced stage of the game. And I see them transitioning with difficulty to blindness. How would any of us transition to blindness. It is something that is almost impossible to prepare for. I usually refer patients to a colleague of mine who is a psychiatrist, but who is very much involved in cognitive behavior therapy and the talking therapies, just so that they have some sort of formal support as they go through um, the various stages of um, approaching blindness. It is almost like a grief reaction, anger, denial, um, blaming themselves and then cycling back through all of that through depression. Um, we have to involve the family for sure, family support. Some of the people with very advanced glaucoma who have not gone blind but who have tunnel vision are still driving or trying to drive and we get into all kinds of negotiations where the relatives have said, you know, I told them, I told them they shouldn't be driving and they're saying, but I can still see, I can, you know, I can get to the supermarket. So we have to make sure the family is involved for the, yeah, for the good of all of us in the long run. We have an adjustment to blindness officer at the National Disabilities Unit, and she is a vital resource, but there's only one of her. We need a whole team who, who could go out to patients' homes, see the things that we can do to adjust and make the lives ease more easy, uh, because adjusting to low vision is not about giving up things. You have to really focus on doing things differently and teaching people how to appreciate that and how to achieve that. And she does a lot of that work. So I really enlist the help of whichever member of the team uh, is necessary at the time. Question? Dr. Crozen, um, as discussed previously, we were mentioning that uh, glaucoma is not defined by high eye pressures, as we have normal tension glaucoma. Um, my question, though, is, um, this is actually to add to Dr. Adam's question. Uh, what's the role for the primary healthcare physician uh, when you have screening for diabetes, you have screening for um, hypertension? Uh, what's the role of the handheld blood um, eye care monitors in the polyclinics and in the primary healthcare setting? Because um, we do know, even though it's not defined by high pressures, most of our, the vast majority of our glaucoma patients um, do have um, elevated blood, pre I mean, eye pressures. Sure, and eye pressure is the, raised eye pressure is the number one risk factor. So if we're doing a rapid screening and we can do nothing else, we check eye pressure and eye pressure alone. Uh, in the primary care setting, 
at the moment, I think family physicians and GPs will be equipped with ophthalmoscopes and they can look at the optic nerve. So even if they don't have an eye pressure monitor, they could look at the optic nerve for signs of damage. If you don't want to go to that level, you can just encourage your patient to go for an eye test at an optometrist or an ophthalmologist um, to have their glaucoma check done. We now have wonderful handheld instruments, the eye care tonometer that um, Dr. Holmes is referring to, which is what we use a lot in our free screenings. And that is easy for any physician to handle. And perhaps when we get to the point of integrating eye care into primary health care, perhaps those uh, primary care providers who are interested could use the eye care tonometer. It's very quick and easy to use. Anyone with a medical or nursing background, an ophthalmic assistant, an ophthalmic technician, it's very easy to teach those persons to do a quick eye pressure check with the eye care tonometer. Um, one of the things we have to be mindful of when we are quote unquote screening for glaucoma is to make sure that downstream we have systems in place to handle the cases that are going to be produced. Because it's all well and good to find all 7,000 people in Barbados that have glaucoma, but then if they can't get in to see an eye doctor to get treatment, get the official diagnosis, etc., we still have this huge bottleneck. So the system has to develop on have, has to be developed on many levels, not just on you know getting those tonometers in place and doing eye pressure checks and teaching people to do that, but in making sure we develop the whole thing downstream to care for these patients. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Yeah. And I know you mentioned in your lecture that peripheral vision tends to be very hard to pick up as you're losing it. I just wondered if there are any tests we could do at home or is there any equipment that may be available to the general public that we can maybe start to pick up when we're starting to lose that vision mm. and then schedule the appointment. And mm. in addition, Earlier, a question was asked about whether the risk factor being related to race. And just wondered oh because, yeah. you know, it that. seems like being of that West African descent seems to be a risk factor for pretty much everything <laughs> in life. So <laughs> just on the but, but not for age-related macular degeneration. So, ah, you know, yeah. got one on our side. Um, yes, other races have been studied. Primary open angle glaucoma is the most common kind of glaucoma in all races that are studied. But other forms of glaucoma can be more prevalent in the Asian and Chinese descent population. So angle closure glaucoma, the kind that is rarer in our population, is very uh, much more prominent in China, in Singapore, in Hong Kong. And the very large, just, just like the Barbados Eye Studies is that very large study on a population of African descent, the large population studies of angle closure glaucoma have been done in the East, in China, in Singapore, in Hong Kong, and they continue to be done in those countries. What was the other part of the question? The other part is to any early Visual field testing. Uh, my patients hate to go for visual field tests. It's a computerized test. The kids love it because to them it's like a little video game. Um, the visual testing, the peripheral visual field is done on a computerized machine where tiny points of light are projected by the machine in different parts of your peripheral vision. And when we're talking about peripheral vision, we're talking about all this vision out to the side. And then you press, press a buzzer every time you see the point. That can be a bit tedious, so researchers and Morefields is one of the places where they have been looking at developing this laptop-based visual field test and trialing that. That's actually been trialed in Africa and places that don't have access to the computerized visual field test. That can be used as a screening test for glaucoma, this laptop test, but it's not something that's been ruled out to the public or that's widely available. But for groups that do charity work and eye camps out in the field, that's one of the things that they've been doing, laptop-based visual field testing. Given that we don't have that, how do you test your visual field? Um, what you want to do is make sure you can see out of the corner of your eye, as we say. So if you, and we do it one eye at a time. So you close one eye, you make sure that you can see your finger out to the side in all the different directions. You close the other eye and you do it the same way. Now if you go too far, you're not going to see anything, right? This is what the, the medical students learn to do that as we come through ophthalmology. That is a very crude way of testing your visual field. Um, then we learn to do it in a more refined manner with hat pins. But really the best way of testing it is with the computerized visual field testing. But if you just wanted to check, that is what you could do. Dr. Gravno? Yes, sir. Good evening, ma'am. It's a pleasure to sit here and listen to you. 
I'm happy to be here because I feel welcome. You are welcome. Yes, thank you. It is believed that beta blockers can increase your heart rate or cause heart disease. That's one question. It is also believed that stress can cause glaucoma. I'll wait for those answers and I'll ask you another one, please. <laughs> All right, I will start with the last one, stress and glaucoma. Um, we don't know a lot about exactly what stress does to the eye and what it does to the eye pressure, but we know that lifestyle factors, we've come to learn actually, that lifestyle factors can play a role in controlling the eye pressure. Um, traditionally, we were thought that you know this eye pressure is all about what's happening in the eye and the lifestyle factors don't play as great a role. But now we know that stress could affect your eye pressure, not to a great de degree, but to a slight degree. Um, that um, unhealthy lifestyles, if you have a high salt diet and you're retaining fluid, that could increase your eye pressure. In spite of all of that, those things haven't translated into an increased risk of glaucoma. They numerically might change your eye pressure, but they don't increase your risk of glaucoma. They haven't been proven to increase your risk of glaucoma. However, if you're already a glaucoma patient, you don't want to add anything to what's already going on, and that's why we say a healthy lifestyle as far as possible. Beta blockers in terms of eye drop form, they are utilized in the treatment of glaucoma to lower the eye pressure. And rather than raising the heart rate, they actually can lower the heart rate slightly in, in some patients. The amount of medication in a beta blocker eye drop is m minuscule, but there are still some patients who are sensitive. So one of the things we ask before we put, put, put a patient on a beta blocker is to find out if they're on a beta blocker already from their physician for another reason, maybe for their blood pressure or for a heart problem. Um, and so you shouldn't fear the beta blockers because they have good uses in medicine um, and certainly excellent uses in glaucoma. But if we find somebody is sensitive to it, then we have to avoid it. Thank you. Ne next Did I answer both questions? <laughs> I have another one for you, ma'am. Can I go ahead? Go ahead. Oh. It is believed that I missed that one. Ah, oh shoot. You're, you're looking like me and forgetting your questions the way I was I forgetting seem to, mine. I seem to have forgotten that. That's all right. We, we yeah. can always discuss it oh, afterwards. Dr. Grover. I have enough. I have enough. Okay. Can you explain what is chronic glaucoma and acute glaucoma? Okay, I tried not to go too deeply into too many things in the lecture, but we can classify the four types of glaucoma in many different ways. Um, chronic glaucoma is primary open angle glaucoma or primary angle closure glaucoma. Any glaucoma that is present for a long period of time, that's what we call chronic. Or whose onset happens over a long period of time, and those are the common types of glaucoma. Acute glaucoma is very rare, and that's associated with angle closure where the drainage angle of the eye is abnormally narrow. And as you get older and older, it gets narrow and narrow until it closes off completely. If your drainage system in your eye closes completely, suddenly none of the fluid that is being produced gets drained away. The, all of that fluid backs up and your pressure goes high very quickly and you get acute symptoms. So you get pain, headache, blurred vision, and a red eye. Um, that is acute glaucoma and it's extremely rare. We see that more in the angle closure glaucoma patients, patients of perhaps of Chinese or Asian descent, but we, can, we still see a portion of angle closure glaucoma in our population. So that's the difference. Chronic glaucoma, which is primary open angle glaucoma, is the one that's silent, no symptoms at all. Yes, Dr. Grobner. Yes, Thank you Mr. Your, Clark. Thank you for your kind lecture. I must say I, I was very impressed. I want to ask a question. Is glaucoma hereditary? And if so, how do you convince people that they have to be tested early? Because you, you, from your lecture, you said that early detection is very crucial. I'm aware that people do not necessarily want to trouble trouble until trouble trouble you. No. Uh, and if you drive on the road, you find that sometimes you are witnessing a number of persons who appear to be 
half blind, cannot see. And you, you really wonder if these people are really, um, they don't know if they're blind or not. And I think the, the question is that you have to be able to sensitize the population into testing their eyesight at an early age. Also, the doctors, the GPs, I think it's incumbent of every GP to test their patient from early age because I have heard cases where a lady came to me one morning at my office to say, I went, I went to sleep okay and wake up next morning blind. Is this possible? Is this really possible? It's possible, but not from glaucoma. Usually glaucoma doesn't work that way. Even the acute kind doesn't happen overnight when you're sleeping. In fact, sleep constricts your pupil and protects you from acute glaucoma. But other things can happen to your eyes overnight. You can damage your blood vessel. You can have bleeding in your eye. Many other things can happen. Um, glaucoma is only one of the reasons that people in Barbados should be getting an eye track. Hypertension can affect the eye. Diabetes can affect the eye very severely. So really and truly, all of us in Barbados should be getting a, a regular eye track. But how do we convince people who don't have a problem that they need to go and get their eyes checked, particularly if they're going to do it in the private sector and we're telling them to spend some money to go and get their eyes checked? This is a very difficult question. This is about behavior change, it's about reaching people and convincing them of the benefit as opposed to the risk. And I don't have the complete answer to that one. I think we, you know, we have to get the word out, we have to raise the awareness level for sure, so that those people who will respond to a message about early detection to save your vision can be reached. And then we have to deal with the next tier of people who we've reached and who've decided I don't want to trouble trouble until trouble troubles me. Mm. Not realizing that trouble might be troubling you and you might not know that you're in trouble. Right. And the last question I want to ask, the relationship between alcohol and glaucoma, um, is it real? And then diabetes, because some people believe once you have diabetes, you will have glaucoma and you'll go blind. Mm. And I have a number of um, constituents who are very aware have diabetes because you're catching diabetes now from very early mm. and um, you go to the polyclinic I have a young young girl 15 go to the polyclinic one morning to find, to find out that she has diabetes mm -hmm. and the parents are saying she will go blind how do you convince people with diabetes that it is not necessarily that you will go blind mm. I'll deal with the alcohol question first and go on. Uh, alcohol use is not a risk factor for glaucoma. I almost hesitate to say that because we don't want people to go off and, you know, go overboard with the alcohol use. But we know that if you are a heavy alcohol user, that can actually damage your, um, damage your optic nerve independently. So heavy alcohol use is still not a good idea. Um, in terms of diabetes, glaucoma, and the eye, diabetes can affect the eye independent of glaucoma. You have a whole entity of diabetic eye disease that affects the little blood vessels at the back of the eye, and that can lead to scarring and retinal detachment. And it's true, in the worst case scenario, severe diabetic eye disease could lead to blindness. It actually is one of the causes of blindness that was identified in the Barbados eye studies. Less commonly so than glaucoma, but it still exists. Um, the key to preventing that is to control the diabetes over a period of over uh, the lifetime of the patient to make sure it doesn't get out of hand, to make sure the blood blood sugars are not fluctuating, and also diabetics should be having annual eye checks. As long as you have diabetes mellitus, you should be having an annual eye test because um, these changes from diabetic eye disease can be detected, treated early, and and eliminated, particularly with uh, better control of the blood sugar. There is an entity in very severe diabetic eye disease where the eye produces abnormal blood vessels that leads to a kind of secondary glaucoma, where the blood vessels grow into the drainage system of the eye and causes the eye pressure to go up. That is an extremely rare scenario because not only do you have to have diabetes, you then have to have diabetes causing diabetic eye disease. It has to be severe enough that you're producing new blood vessels and your new blood vessels have to grow into the drainage angle of the eye. It is uncommon, but we see too much of that. And often it happens because in that sequence of events, patients have never had an eye test 
You have a diabetic patient who's never had an eye test, so all of this has been evolving over time. So if diabetic patients have regular eye checks and they control their eye pressure, their, uh, their blood sugar, there's no reason for them to go blind. Quick question. Um, what would be the journey for a suspected, suspected patient hmm. from the time they get the, the check until the end? Like, until the after usage, what do we have to do? Hmm. Eye drops, surgery? Okay. You mean if you are confirmed to have glaucoma at some stage? It's different for everyone. Uh, at a young stage, it's still different for everyone. Some people go on one eye drop. If you're really diagnosed as glaucoma at a young age, some people are on one eye drop and that controls their eye pressure for years and years to come, maybe decades. Other people cycle through treatments very quickly and go on one eye drop that might work for a year and then we add a second one, then a third one. And if, you're not, if that's not working, then you might go on to eye surgery. It takes a, a varying amount of time for people to get to eye surgery uh, and to cycle through the treatment because every eye is different and every patient is different. Particularly if something has happened to the eye before, like an injury or chronic inflammation or some other eye disease, then your glaucoma is harder to control and you cycle through more quickly. If it is garden variety, glaucoma, and there's no other uh, problem, then it, it really can, it just depends individually on that person's glaucoma. You could go your whole life and never have eye surgery. You can go your whole life and just be on one eye drop, or you can be diagnosed and a year later you need eye surgery. It really is impossible to predict, and that is why it's so important to be, to work with your eye doctor and be guided by them. Keep up with the checks when you're supposed to. Um, this topic has certainly generated a lot of interest, so let's come down to our last I was going to say question, but it's going to be two. It's, I see so many hands going up all of a sudden. So <laughs> let's go. Okay, two quick questions. Um, what is the effect of overcast conditions uh, on people who suffer with glaucoma? And secondly, in what circumstances do you prescribe more than one eye drop? People with glaucoma tend to struggle <clears throat> tend to struggle in dim light. So overcast conditions, and particularly at dusk, they can struggle a little more. And often they have a problem with the night vision. And often it is the night driving that causes a problem. On the other hand, I've had glaucoma patients who say their vision is better in dim light because they start to be affected more by glare in sunlight. So it seems there's a bit of a dichotomy. Traditionally, the teaching is that glaucoma patients struggle more in dim light, but I found that some struggle more in bright light because of the glare. So once again, it's an individual thing. What was the second question? Uh, when to go on more than one eye draw? If one, what we're trying to do with the eye drops and treatment for glaucoma is to lower the eye pressure to a point where your glaucoma damage to the nerve is stabilized. And we can see that as we do visual field tests over time. If we see that your pressure is 16 and your visual field test is not changing, then we know that eye drop is working. If then over time your eye pressure goes up to 20 and 21 on the same eye drop, then we know, okay, well that eye drop is no longer working you need to add something to that. Or it's no longer working as it should, because it's probably still working, just not as well as originally. So that is how we judge it, by what the eye pressure is doing. And then if the visual field test is also showing deterioration, then we know, okay, the damage to the nerve is changing. We need to make sure we, we lower that eye pressure a little more to stabilize it. All right, last question from Dr. George. Yes, you talked a lot about a stepwise treatment, but are there any instances where you would choose surgery as your primary therapy? So somebody that has a very high pressure, they probably have damage to the nerve, would you choose, say, to just go straight to surgery rather than going through the drops? Talking about surgery is such a shock to the system for most people, it's very difficult to jump straight to that option. But we know that in patients with advanced glaucoma at diagnosis, that they will probably require surgery quickly. So for those patients, for example, if I'm seeing someone for the first time who has 95% damage to their nerve and they're 50, we don't have a lot of time to play with 
particularly if their pressure is also 50. So what we do is put them on the maximum number of eye drops immediately and start a discussion on surgery. So I would say we're going to start this treatment with the eye drops and we hope that that will bring the pressure down adequately. But if it doesn't, we're going to have to consider surgery. That helps to raise, raise the prospects in people's minds. It helps them to bring their questions to the fore without overloading them too much with, you have glaucoma, it's really bad, you need an operation. So we give them a little time to let that sink in. And that time might just be six weeks or eight weeks, but, but you still need a, a little time because if you uh, pressure people too quickly or if you overload their system, then they will draw back and you, you lose that opportunity for good treatment. I, I don't, sure, but I don't think that we would ever rush the surgery as a primary thing without first trying the eye drops because if we put them on eye, and surgery has its risks and its benefits. We do a wonderful job, but nothing is without risks. The risk, uh, the risk profile for eye drops is far less than surgery. So if we can give them a trial of eye drops, if they work, fantastic. If they don't, well, we know we have an option in waiting. Well, um, I'm sure Ms. Grosvenor won't leave the building immediately, and there'll probably be still be time for two or three um, consultations with her uh, before she leaves. But I think we're going to need to have a uh, move on to our next and final part, which is the vote of thanks, which will be given by Ms. Christiane Walcott, and um, she's going to also going to remind us. Ms. Walcott is also going to remind us of what's upcoming next month. Unfortunately, the speaker for next month is left already, so she can't be directly introduced to you. Thank you, Dean. And ladies and gentlemen, before we bring this evening's proceedings to a close, there are, of course, a few people that we absolutely need to thank for making tonight possible. First, our featured speaker of the evening, Ms. slash Dr. Don Grosvenor. When I first began to build out um, the programming for this series, I have to say that Don was certainly one of the people who was most eager and most enthusiastic to jump on board with what we were hoping to do. So I want to thank her for her eagerness. I know that this is something that she loves to do. I think we can all see that she's passionate about what she's talking about. She knows her stuff. And I think, you know, it, it really has been a privilege to listen to you tonight, Dawn. So thank you very much. <laughs> to our Dean, Dr. Peter Adams, for serving as Master of Ceremonies and moderator for keeping tonight's program flowing, if not short. Um, so we appreciate your diligence with that, sir. Mr. Callender, who has certainly been nothing short of a mentor to Dr. Grosvenor, helping her to refine her skills and perfect her craft. We thank him for his kind and eloquent in introduction. And while we're making mention of people who've stood around Dawn in her training and all through her journey, I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Grosvenor, who are here. If you could just wave for us. <laughs> and by extension, we thank them for the support that they've given to Dawn through the years. To the support personnel behind the scenes who have made tonight possible by tirelessly working, Mrs. Kiana Hall, one of our laboratory technologists, Ms. Keisha Maskell, who's provided additional support, Mr. Cedric Aline, our campus media services team that you see with the cameras and standing in the, in the shadows and the corridors. And of course, our undergraduate medical students who are so finely decked out in their black and white or all black with their little green ribbons that were so nicely donated by Dr. Grosvenor. Um, we want to thank them for their volunteering spirit. They're always ready and available and we thank them, led by, ably led by their president, Mr. Tillon Gordon. And last, but by no means least, we want to thank all of you, the public, for coming out and showing such robust support for this uh, lecture series that we're running in honor of the 50th anniversary of Barbados' independence. And before we go, um, for, we weren't able to acknowledge the presence of Mr. Glenn Clark, the Member of Parliament for St. George North. So welcome, sir. Thank you for coming to join us. And again, I want to underscore the attendance of and support of Mrs. Patricia Atherley, who is the campus co-chair for the 50th anniversary 
activities that the campus has been mounting throughout the entire year. She's really been a, a pillar of support for our faculty in particular. She supports us in so many other ways in professional development activities and certainly this lecture series is no exception. And before I go, as Dr. Adams pointed out, you know, we have a, a, a well, quite a generous lineup from, well, from April through November, our remaining lectures in the series. Um, on average, a, a, a presentation per month. Next month's presentation, which is also indicated on the back of your programs, and I hope you won't leave without taking one with you. Um, the next attraction is April 21st. That lecture will be delivered by Dr. Michelle Lashley. Diabetes in children, past issues, present concerns, and future prospects. And we have Dr. Kohal, who made um, an extensive plug for his presentation in May. Um, do you have that date available for us yet, Dr. Kohal? We're still working on it? The 19th. So we'll, we'll continue to look out for that in our press announcements and so. So that's April 21st, May 19th, that's Dr. Kohal. That will be a panel discussion on medical marijuana, medical breakthrough or further hindrance to the development of Caribbean youth, right? Also on the back of your program, you will see the email address and some telephone numbers for the Faculty of Medical Sciences. If you have additional questions that you have for tonight's presenter, previous presenters, or the lectures to come, if you'd like more information on our lecture series and what's available, please do call us, email us um, to get the rest of the lineup, and we'd be more than happy to answer your questions. So on that note, thank you once again for coming, and do get home safely. Thank you.